Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Gary Pollack. I'm the Senior Vice President of Domo Health and part of the leadership team for NJBIA's Not-for-Profit Council. We're so glad you can make it for this month's educational programming. Just a quick reminder that we are recording. Everyone who registered will get a copy of the recording along with any slides tomorrow. Before we get started, a quick shout out to our partners for helping to make this happen. Associate Member Trust, Citizen Bank, Focus New Jersey, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield, Nisavachia, NJBIA HR Support Center, NJ Business Magazine, and New Jersey Manufacturing Insurance Company. Thank you for supporting this important work. And another quick bit of housekeeping, in case you're new, just a quick shout out to my fellow not-for-profit leadership team, co-chairs Dawn Doherty from the Society for the Prevention of Teen Suicide, Sally Glick of Sobel Company, Joseph Perez of Witham, Smith & Brown, and Mary Lonergan of the Covenant House. And now a quick word from BIA. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Randy Stevens. I am the Business Relationship Manager for the NJBIA. Thank you so much for supporting this council. Um, and as Gary mentioned, uh, this session is being recorded. Attendees will receive an email tomorrow with the recording. Uh, depending on what time we finish today, we may have some time for some networking at the end of the meeting, uh, but there is a lot we have to cover. Uh, we are thrilled to see this group assist our many not-for-profit members and continue to foster collaboration with our corporate members. Uh, we're so happy to have such a strong leadership team guiding the way. Uh, for those of you who are new to the NJBIA, we are the largest statewide business association in the country. We represent about 1 million jobs in the state of New Jersey, which equates to about 25% of New Jersey's workforce. Uh, we offer customer development opportunities, visibility through our events, our magazine ads, um, our podcasts, and our TV shows, uh, tons of money-saving discounts on stuff you're already probably paying for, um, things like payroll, healthcare, 401k, uh, and our new HR support solutions. Um, if you're interested in more information about us, I'll drop the website into the chat. Um, along with my contact information. Feel free uh, to be in touch with me and anyone from our team, and we'll do our best to help you with whatever you need. Um, also, feel free to drop your contact information into the chat for being with us today uh, in hopes of us being able to keep some of this networking going. Um, one last reminder, uh, switch your view from gallery to speaker so you can focus in on who's speaking at the time. Um, as Gary mentioned, again, the directions to do that will be in the chat. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Gary Pollock. We'll take it from here. And again, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Randy. The Not-for-Profit Council is comprised of non-for-profits and business leaders of all backgrounds who convene to engage in meaningful dialogue, share successful business practices, and develop programs that support strategic growth within New Jersey. During this session, we invite you to please place any questions you have in the chat box. We will synthesize these questions and pose them to our speaker following the presentation. Also, please feel free to add to the chat your name and contact information so that we can continue the network afterwards. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. I'm proud to introduce Elaine Katz, Senior Vice President of Grants and Communications, and Diana Jordan, Assistant Digital Media Editor, both from the Kessler Foundation. They both delve into the art of choosing the right story, leveraging data-driven insights, and utilizing keywords to maximize audience engagement. And with that, Elaine and Diane, take us away. Thank you so much, Gary. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Diane and I are so pleased to be with you here today to discuss storytelling. We're gonna tag team the presentation and leave plenty of room at the end for questions. Next slide. So hopefully today when the presentation ends, um, you'll know how to identify key components of winning stories, understand how to choose the right story, leverage data, and maximize engagement, and also learn how-tos and expert tips for marketing stories. But before we started, I just want to share a little bit about Kessler Foundation. Um, so we're located in East Hanover, New Jersey, and our mission is to change the lives of people with disabilities through rehabilitation research, improving cognition and mobility for individuals with various kinds of disabilities, which we do by testing new interventions and gathering data, which can improve daily functioning and independence. 
We're also known as the leading funder for innovative employment in our center for grant making. And through that initiative, we've um, invested more than $50 million to create genuine economic opportunities for people with disabilities in employment, both in New Jersey and nationally. And through both these projects, we hope to increase the community inclusion of people with disabilities. Our in-house communication team works in all areas of communications, which is writing and graphic and web design, photography, video, social media, and podcasting. So let's begin. Next slide, please. So why storytelling? Well, it's really all about getting that word out on your organization to the public. And we tell stories every single day. Stories are a powerful art form that communicate ideas and values and lessons, which may be fictional or true. Stories can be used to inform or instruct or persuade others. Businesses most often are using stories to um, market or do branding. While nonprofits typically are using stories to recruit volunteers or appeal to donors and convey their mission to the broader community. Joel Oros, a well-known writer in the philanthropic space, um, has written, great leaders aren't necessarily smarter people. They're just the ones who tell the best stories. And stories are often used to change people's minds which is why the message and the way it's conveyed is so important. We tend to remember information and facts better when they're in stories. Stories appeal to our different learning styles, whether they're auditory, whether they're tactile, whether they're visual, or perhaps a combination of those. And may I suggest you're already a storyteller. So, you know, in the morning when somebody comes up to you and said, how are you doing? What's new with you? And you tell them that's really storytelling. Next slide, please. So what are some of the common elements of a story? These days, stories could be presented in what you may think about as a traditional way, which may be on print or a movie screen. However, more commonly now it's digital, which could be web and podcast, social media. To tell your story effectively, you must choose the right story and develop a budget if you have some funding, but also decide what mechanism tells your story best. And in a moment, Diana's gonna walk you through all these different details. However, all stories, regardless of how they're presented, have some common elements. First, there's the idea, the concept, the information you're trying to get across or your why. Next is your writing, scripting, and storyboard what's taking place. And this is especially important if you're using a team approach to whatever you're working on, whether you're using graphic artists or external audio people or video people, whatever it may be. So now we have the idea, we have the story um, and we're gonna draft a script. How the story will be shared with your audience is really important to figure out. And because that determines the right mechanism for sharing your story. And the last is voice. Who's telling the story? Is it a first person story? Is it a third person story? Is it a testimonial for a product or service? Is it sharing um, your mission as an organization? So as you can see from some of these pictures on the slide, some of these further define these details, these common elements. You have the characters who's featured in the story, the setting where the story is taking place, the plot of the conclusion, what's the story about, and what's the final takeaway? What do you want the viewer or the reader or the listener to come away with? Is there a call to action, for example? Next slide. Sometimes we forget and we get so caught up in our story and content that we forget the individual, if you will, in the people we are um, featuring. And it's really important to remember the people who are in all of our graphics and our pictures and our illustrations and our artwork. They all have lives beyond the lens. And ethical storytelling aligns those values and those visuals to find an image or clip that is the right image rather than an image of one that works. The wrong image can really reinforce stereotypes of our own and, audi and audiences implicit bias. So how can we tell somebody's story without exploiting them? Always remember to be aware of the messaging behind your story. And Diane, take it away. I'm going to dive into the art of choosing the right story. So there are five different techniques you wanna consider for selecting compelling stories that resonate with your audience. The first technique is understanding the power of storytelling and its impact on your audience's engagement. 
Storytelling can provoke emotions within us, whether it's feelings of joy, sympathy, appreciation, inspiration, etc. Your audience will react to your content if it provokes some sort of emotion within them. And this can deeper the relationship with your audience and keep them coming back for more. So you want to ask yourself, how will I push out my story? Is it with photography? Is it with videos? Is it with printed newsletters? The second technique is articulating a clear purpose for your message up front by answering three questions. What? what? What is it about? What is the story that I'm trying to tell? What does it mean? And how will I tell it? Is it with a, through a video or graphic? The second question is who? Who is the audience? Who are you trying to tell the story to? Who are you trying to connect with? Is it with a specific age group? Perhaps, you know, in my case, a specific disability community? And the third question is why? Why is it important? Why is what you're telling important? What is the purpose? Is it to persuade or influence someone? Is it to raise awareness? Why will your audience be interested in this? And what makes it important to them? The third technique is scheduling your content and timing it. So something that's crucial to storytelling is making sure that the timing is appropriate. So if you plan to post specific days, say on social media to coincide with public holidays or you know events that are happening either nationally or internationally, your storytelling can be seen as much more meaningful. Becoming involved in a public holiday or event also puts your organization on the radar. So, you know, if there is a popular hashtag that is being used, you can use that hashtag and people will click on it and, you know, have the opportunity to see your organization. Since our organization is centered around helping people with disabilities, I look up disability holidays personally when I'm making my calendar. So for example, our research focuses on autism, spinal cord injury, multiple sclerosis, traumatic brain injury, employment, mobility, et cetera. So majority of the holidays and events that I look up are centered around those areas of research. So I mentioned a calendar. One way to keep track of special days and you know scheduling your content and your stories is to create something called an editorial calendar. So this is pretty much a visual workflow that can help schedule what days you'd like to post specific things on. And this can be done in Excel. You know, if you don't have Excel, this can be done on a free calendar website. Or if you don't want to even do it online on a website, you can do it on paper. You could just write down, you know, the month. You could write down on the side the dates and then whatever notes that you want to, you know, push out with that. So this is an example of our editorial calendar. I use this all the time. Um, you know, as you could see, September is a pretty busy month. On the left-hand side, I have the subject column. So I have, you know, the September campaigns, and then I have September activities. So all the list of the certain days that I will be pushing out our stories and, you know, content on. And then next to that is the dates column. So that obviously shows the dates of when this will be happening. And then next to that on the right is says dev slash com. So that means dev development and communications. And that is a department that we work closely with. So, um, you know, we're not stepping on any toes. So I like to put them on there. So if they're posting something, I'll mark it down so that I don't, you know, repeat the post. Then next to that, I have print and e-blast. So if I'm pushing out something in print or if it's going to be on an e-blast, like an email sent, then I'll mark one of those down. Um, and then beside that, we have the website section. So if we're going to be sharing this to our website with a hero or banner, if we're going to be pushing it out you know, with a blog or a press release, I'll mark those off. And then the rest of it is our Facebook and you know our Instagram or Twitter. So you know, if I'm going to be posting on one of those, I'll mark it off just to keep track of what accounts that I'll be posting on. And then on the far right hand side, you could see I have a notes section. So this is pretty much just some details to keep me in track of what I'm going to be posting about, what stories I'm going to be telling, the details, you know, who's going to be doing what, etc. Um, so having a calendar, you know, either a year in advance or month by month basis is a great technique for planning your storytelling so that other people in your organization know what you're pushing out and they can plan accordingly. So, you know, for example, if you have a campaign or a fundraiser, you may need to start planning that like a year in advance. So, you know, this is this type of calendar is a great for that and can help other departments within your organization stay up to date. 
The fourth technique is capturing and sustaining the attention of your audience. So you want to ask yourself, how do I capture my audience's attention and provoke some sort of emotion within them? So one way is with an intriguing headline. So, you know, headlines lure your audience in whatever type of media you're pushing out, whether it's print, it's graphics, it's podcasts, videos, et cetera. So for example, if I were making a social media post promoting, say, a webinar, a uh, headline that I might not use would be something like, our webinar on, on spinal cord injury is on October 1st, 2023. It's kind of boring. It's not really intriguing. It doesn't sound inviting for people. So a better headline you could start with is something like, are you or someone you know struggling to adapt to life after spinal cord injury? Join our webinar on October 1st and explore valuable tips, resources, and strategies to help you succeed. So as you could see, I started that headline with a question. So starting your idea with a question can help the audience identify what applies to them and what doesn't. It also keeps, you know, your audience coming back for more information. So if they see that question and they answer yes to that, they'll keep reading. And if they answer no, they'll keep scrolling. Another way to capture your audience's attention is including a statistic to support your statement. So, you know, engaging posts can start with a statistic like, did you know more than 2.8 million people worldwide have an MS diagnosis? So, you know, if the information you're pushing out is factual, then, you know, including these statistics is an interesting way to help support your statement and grab someone's attention. And lastly, you want to structure your topics into short, digestible, bite-sized pieces of information. So, you know, when storytelling, you don't want your wording to drag on. You want to keep it simple and concise. People's attention span nowadays is like an average of like eight seconds. So you want to make sure that your audience is intrigued. You want to avoid long wordy sentences or, you know, if you're pushing out scientific information or research like we do, you want to make sure you don't use too many terms that the general public may not understand. You can even section out your content to make it more readable as well. The last technique I'm sharing with you is about bringing your content to life through design. So visualization is essential for storytelling, for multimedia, whether it's print, it's website, it's reels, it's social media, et cetera. So when you're creating your media, you want to use colors that pair well with the message that you're trying to convey. So again, you want to ask yourself, what is the story that I'm telling? Is this something that I want to provoke happiness within people or sympathy or inspiration? Because specific colors can stimulate certain senses. So warm colors like red, orange, yellow can evoke feelings of happiness, optimistic energy, passion. You know, So if your story is uplifting, inspiring, you may want to include a combination of those colors. These are a couple examples of some designs that I created for some events that we had over the summer. So on the left-hand side, you see we have a summer barbecue that we had in the summer. And I included, you know, yellow, I included orange, these warm colors. On the right-hand side, I had a Hawaiian shirt day contest that we did. So I created this little, you know, design for it. And I included some pink, some reds, a little bit of yellow in the flowers. So, you know, it's obviously a positive, fun event. So I wanted to make sure the colors matched with that energy. Another tip for design is using icons with similar styles and colors to stay consistent and professional looking within your visual presentation. So, you know, your audience looks for consistency within your content, even though you want your content to be fun and engaging and different every time. You should also make sure that it's professional looking so that's taken seriously. So to do this, you can either choose a color scheme within some of your posts. It doesn't have to be all of them. Or, you know, if your organization has its own color scheme, like ours is green and blue, I tend to include those in a lot of our posts. So, um, you know, if there's a specific newsletter or content or, you know, something that happens regularly, like a webinar every month, um, keeping the same colors and styles with that, with those postings and with those stories can help your audience identify with you and your brand. So for example, um, you know, on the left-hand side here, you could see I have a little template that I use for our newsletter. So we have multiple newsletters that go out and I created this template to use so that whenever we have a new one, I can push it out and use the same kind of style. So I will just change the titling of it depending on what newsletter it is. And then I'll change the dates on the bottom. And then on the right-hand side, I have another template that I like to use. It's called Where in the World is Kessler Foundation? So 
I use this when our scientists are going away on conferences around the world. So I'll switch out, obviously, the name of the conference because that changes. And then I'll switch out the headshots and the titling, the names of the scientists that are going. And then I'll also switch out, you know, the map of where it is and then the dates. But I try to stay consistent with these, a couple of these posts so that people recognize it. Now, if you have data that you're presenting in your content, you want to make sure that it's understandable to your audience. So you need to include a visual aspect of the data, you know, like a graph or chart, et cetera, so that people can visualize the content. So these are a couple examples of our graphs that we push out. So we do a webinar um, twice a month with national trends. It's called National Trends in Disability Employment. So, um, you know, on the left hand side, you could see I have a blue and green chart. And those replicate the year to year number. So there's July 22 to July 2023. On the right hand side, there's orange and purple chart, and that replicates the the month to month number. So June 2023 to July 2023. So those colors stay consistent. So every time we push out these graphs monthly, the colors stay the same. So that when people see the blue and green chart, they go, oh, those are the year to year numbers. Or when they see the orange and purple chart, they say, oh, that's the month to month numbers and they recognize it. Now I'm going to pass it back over to Elaine to talk about digital accessibility. So it's really important um, that your story reach everyone in your audience that you intended. And that's where media accessibility comes in. Um, so what is digital or media accessibility? These terms refer to how the um, print or um, web or broadcast content is really can be viewed or read and accept, um, easily understood by lots and lots of people, especially the 1.8 billion people globally who have disabilities, those with vision impairments who may be blind, hard of hearing, have cognitive impairments, mobility issues. And the goal of media accessibility is to make sure that everyone, regardless of their ability, can really fully participate in whatever you're offering to the public. We're all now very familiar with the captioning that everybody uses in gyms now, and that really started as uh, an accessibility tool for people who are hard of hearing. Next slide. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, talk to you a little bit about some of the different types of media accessibilities which your businesses could use or organizations could use in storytelling, depending on the storage and the medium. I mean, this could be a whole course in itself, but I'm just going to go through some key points um, of these accessibility tools. So we have accessibility web content, making sure that your website and digital platforms, again, are, are um, organized and act easily and designed in a way that can be easily accessed by um, everyone, including people with disabilities. We have alternate text or alt text, and that's used for images and video. And that's really the written description that's behind a picture and in online information. So alt text gives screen readers, which is a tool used by people with visual impairments, something to read aloud when it encounters it. For example, going through a website or going through an ad online. You can add all text to all your media. Also, the social media platforms um, also have an opportunity to do that, like Facebook and um, LinkedIn, all behind their platforms when you add media like that. Um, there's also closed caption subtitles. So what that does, it provide text that displays the dialogue and sometimes other relevant sounds uh, that are on screen. And it makes it possible for deaf or hard of hearing people to follow along. Um, we're all now familiar with live or printed text transcripts. You see that in Zoom, you see that in um, Teams as well. And that enables people to follow the content during a live presentation. But more importantly, it's not just for people who have hearing um, impairments. It really works for people who um, have reading or learning disabilities as well. And um, sometimes you may see a live presentation when you're actually at an event or even online uh, with something called CART, which is communication access real-time uh, translation. And this is a speech-to-text interpreting system that uses a human captioner um, to transcribe the spoken word. It's very similar to what uh, is used in a courtroom, except it's a little bit different system. Sign language, sign language interpretation, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. That can be used for live broadcast or videos for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. And then there's some other things you may not be as familiar with. Um, depending on your target audience, you want to make sure you're 
Um, you use accessible print, which may be making your print larger or having the ability to change the font on a website, for example, to make your brochures or events um, more accessible and available to those who need it. You may also um, be interested in using Braille, depending on the audience. Um, there's something called easy to read formats. And that, if you think of that as changing the grade level. So, you know, you might, for us, we have technical material that may be an 11th or 12th grade label that's written in a scientific format. We often need to change it to sixth grade or eighth grade label, uh, level language, depending on our audience, to make it more easily understanding and changing some of the word choices. There's also audio description. And those are additional narratives you may see in a film with captioning. So it may see a uh, most show like door opening quietly or a man in the background smiling. And it's not the dialogue, but it's actually what's going on the screen that helps people with visual impairments uh, understand uh, what's going on in a video. Next slide, please. So media accessibility is really not only important from an inclusion standpoint, but really also from a legal standpoint. In many countries, there are laws and regulations that mandate media accessibility to ensure equal access. In the US, we have the Americans with Disabilities Act. We have the Section 508, which is for federal and government contractors. And we also have the 21st Century Communication and Video Accessibility Act, which has provisions specifically related to uh, video programming on television and the internet. And now I'm gonna turn it back to Diana. So the next tip I want to dive into is marketing your stories on social media. So nowadays, there's plenty of platforms for you to market your ideas on. There's Instagram, there's Facebook, there's Twitter, which is now known as X. There's Threads, YouTube, LinkedIn, SoundCloud, etc. But they all have slightly different techniques to promoting, which is crucial to know when you're posting on them. So for example, LinkedIn is a business platform. It's a great way to promote your business, your career, your job, anything centered around the workforce. So when creating a post for LinkedIn, you may want to use more business jargon and have your designs be more professional looking. So, you know, these are a couple examples of the posts that do well on our LinkedIn. As you could see, these are a couple of photos of our scientists. So on the left-hand side, we have a scientist at one of our conferences um, that was in Sydney, Australia. And then on the right-hand side, we have a headshot of one of our scientists for a press release where he received funding. But these posts do well because they're centered around our research and people want to know who's behind the research. So whenever they see, you know, images or videos of our scientists, they are intrigued and they want to learn more. And so they click on the post and they read the caption and everything. So, you know, when it involves our business and our research on LinkedIn, they always do well. Now, compared to Instagram, you know, Instagram is mainly an app focused on videos and images. So, you know, when you go to someone's Instagram profile, you just see a whole grid of photos and videos. Um, you don't see captioning or words unless you click on the actual photo itself. So, you know, with Instagram, it's a little bit trickier. You want to make sure that your design stands out um, in order to be seen. So these are just a couple examples of some designs I've made. On the left-hand side, we have a webinar that I created this for. Um, you know, I included the headshot, I included bright, fun colors, um, you know, bold text. And then on the right hand side is another example post where, you know, the, there's a cool background. We have our logo in there. Uh, we have bold, you know, dark text so people can see what the post is about before they actually click on it. Um, and then, you know, what, you have the green or the orange ribbon to stand out. So Instagram is a bit different than LinkedIn, but those are just a couple examples. Now, if you have multiple social media accounts like we do, there are several platforms for you to use that you can manage your social media that are either free or they don't cost a lot of money. So, you know, some examples of these are Gore Pulse, which is personally what we use. Then we have Hootsuite, we have Buffer, we have Sprout Social, et cetera. The list goes on. Um, so, you know, if you have multiple social media accounts, these platforms make it easy for you to post on them all at once at the same time. Um, you know, if you do want to edit your specific accounts, you know, Know, like I said, LinkedIn might use more business jargon. So you might want to edit the wording in that specific post. You could do that within these platforms. Uh, and, you know, these platforms also track your metrics. So they track your posts, they track your following, they track your likes, they track, you know, when is the best time to post. And this is important to be able to tell what your audience is engaging with and what they tend to ignore. Uh, if you don't choose to use any of these, that's totally fine. Um, you know, you could also do this for free. You know, if you want to just post on Facebook, 
um, itself, or you want to say you just post on LinkedIn, or you only have Twitter or X now, you could use those platforms as well. And those also have their own metrics too. So if you go into your profile, you know, you go into insights, you could find the metrics itself, and that's free for you to use. So now I'm going to get into the types of media that you could use for storytelling. So one popular one that is used nowadays, and it's become increasingly popular during the pandemic, is podcasting. So, you know, this was used when people couldn't get their entertainment in person. They would just listen to podcasts. So there's streaming sites like SoundCloud, there's Spotify, Apple Music, and even YouTube host podcasts for people to tune into. So, you know, if you're looking about starting a podcast, you want to ask yourself, what makes a good podcast? So since not all podcasts include video, the main key is having clear audio. So you want to use a microphone to record um, and that can enhance your podcast. You don't have to use one that's just as extravagant as the one that's here. You know, obviously that that can be very expensive. You don't have to go out and buy like a $500 microphone. You could easily, easily use your phone as a microphone. Or if you do want to purchase something that's inexpensive, you could buy a little clip on microphone and that just clips onto, you know, your shirt so that it's closer and you could hear the audio clearer. So even with a budget, you can buy, you know, something to enhance your podcast. Another thing you want to consider if you are starting a podcast um, is ask yourself how long you want your podcast to be. So you have to think about your audience. So, you know, some podcasts are long, which is good for people to listen to if they're traveling, you know, or they're stuck in traffic or they're doing chores around the house, et cetera. But if your content is scientific, like majority of ours is, you may want to change the language or break up the podcast into multiple episodes or keep it under like 10, five minutes. So for example, we have a podcast called Fast Takes that we do um, where we interview our researchers and scientists about their own research, about the studies, but we like to keep it under five minutes. So that's why they're called fast takes because it's just a lot of information at once. So we like to have them be quick and easy for people to um, digest. Now, if you are looking for a you know, to start a podcast, there are some sites that can help your podcast come to life when you're promoting them, you know, say on social media, or on your website, whatever it is. So for example, this is a website that I use. It's a free site where you could take your MP3 audio of your podcast. You could add a photo, you could add text, captioning, which is very important for accessibility reasons. And then you create a waveform that will move as the speaker talks. Um, you know, this is a great way to have your post be more engaging instead of just, you know, if you're posting on social media, instead of just linking, um, you know, the podcast there and saying, check out our new podcast, this actually creates a little snippet of the podcast. So it's like a little preview. So that will reel people into, you know, what the podcast is and make them want to listen to more. So I'm going to show a quick uh, video. This is an example of one of our headliner post. So this was an interview with one of our scientists. Found that social connectedness or one's social integration had a larger effect on one's health and mortality than, you know, the normal culprits we would think of, such as smoking or exercise or diet or if someone got the flu vaccine. So as you can see, the waveform at the bottom was moving and we included captions, which we always do in all of our content. So again, this is a great way to preview your topic, preview your podcast and reel people in so they'll want to listen to more. Down. So another way of storytelling is through video. So video storytelling is something that can really bring your content to life. Some organizations have way too long of videos on their website that no one wants to watch. They're like 10 minutes long or even longer. But nowadays, a popular use of videos on Facebook and Instagram is known as Reels. And also YouTube has their own version called Shorts. So these are 60 second long videos that are meant to capture your audience's attention and keep them engaged. They're really quick, easy to make. They're meant to be fun and entertaining, and they're meant to get out as much information as possible in a short period of time without overdoing it and providing too much content. So, you know, we recently started creating reels. Um, we have a series called Meet the Researcher that we started where we interview our scientists and our research assistants, our engineers. They talk about their research, you know, whatever studies they're currently working on. And then we record some of that study. So, you know, if they're with a participant, we'll record them just to create a more fun and engaging video. So I'm going to play this one first for you guys so you could see an example. 
Meet the researcher Timothy Rich. My name is Timothy Rich. I'm a research scientist at the Center for Stroke Rehabilitation Research. I conduct research on spatial neglect, which is a disorder seen commonly after stroke. I specifically look at eye movements and head movements related to reading. In this study, we're using wearable eye tracking glasses so that we can separately examine the eye movements and head movements that both contribute to gaze or where somebody looks while they're doing the task, which is important for this population because they tend to have a biased gaze towards their right side. Improving the rehabilitation outcomes for people who've experienced stroke is really what motivates me, seeing improvements in their daily functioning and as a result, quality of life. Learn more about our researchers at kesslerfoundation.org forward slash research. So again, that is one example of a short 60 second video. I have another reel to the right hand side and this reel is a one focused more on study recruitment. So we have a lot of studies that we need participants for. So we created this reel to help um, people sign up for our research study. And this one in particular is for traumatic brain injury. So I'll play that now. Are you 15 to 25 years old and have had a traumatic brain injury? After a TBI, young adults often find they have a difficult time getting into the workforce. What this study seeks to do is give young people the skills they need to succeed and interact with others in the workplace setting. People enrolled in this study will get to learn different skills in a group setting where they get to interact with other people their age, learning how to read other people's emotions, how to interact appropriately, and really fit in so that they will be a model employee by the end of our training. If you're interested to see if you qualify for this study, please visit KesslerFoundation.org, hit Join the Study button, and complete the form at the bottom of the page, and someone will be in touch with you shortly. So again, these reels are meant to be short and sweet to the point. They're very easy to make um, and, you know, they're meant to capture your audience's attention. Now, if you're thinking about creating some of these reels or high quality reel, uh, a good camera is recommended. However, that doesn't mean you have to go out and buy a $500, $1,000 camera. You know, you could easily, easily use your phone. Um, are you phone cameras are great nowadays. They have great quality. So, you know, you if you're on a budget, you don't have to go out and buy something. We personally use GoPros. So if you have that or you have a camera already, you could use that, obviously. But you don't have to go out and buy something. You could just use what you have. But, you know, what about when you're filming and your hand starts to get tired and shaky? Because that does happen, especially if you're filming for a long period of time. Luckily, there are inexpensive gadgets that can help you enhance your video. So a gimbal, which is seen here, is known as a stabilizing tool. So you attach that to your phone or whatever camera that you have so that it holds it. So when you're filming your video, it stays stable and clear. Um, and some, obviously some of these, you know, phones have that nowadays already built in, but this helps it um, stabilize even more. So, you know, if you're doing a panning shot or um, if you even want to put it on like a tripod and keep it still, the gimbal can do that. So this is great for, you know, when you're shooting videos or you're shooting your reel, it's a very quick and easy thing to set up too. So again, um, you know, if you want to track your reels on your Facebook and Instagram accounts, this is very important to see what is working with your reels, what you want to improve for the future. Um, so you are able to track those for free on Facebook and Instagram. Now, my last tip is utilizing keywords for maximum engagement. So, you know, a keyword is a word that describes the content on your page or your post best. So when your audience searches for the internet for a keyword or phrase, you want your content to be the first thing that they see. So this is important for having good SEO and improving your content's traffic, your rankings, your visibility online. And the most important, important place to insert a keyword is in the title. Uh, if you can't insert it in the title for whatever reason, try to insert it within, you know, the first paragraph so that it's higher up, um, you know, whatever it is, a press release, a blog, a social media post, keep it high up. So on the headline or first paragraph. So making sure you have these keywords or phrases allows for your audience to search for your content and creates higher visibility. Now I'm going to pass it back over to Elaine to talk about data. 
Thanks, Diana. So let's talk about the impact of your storytelling. And when we talk about impact, that really means data. How do you know that your story and what you're doing is really working? So data evaluation plays a critical role in effective management and usage of social media platforms and websites. It can provide insights on user behavior. For example, who's interacting with the content, understanding which posts are getting the most engagement, and what day of the week and time are the best to post. It also helps to know if you're meeting your marketing or your business goals. For example, if you're developing a specific marketing strategy, data analysis enables you to segment your audiences in order to target your messaging. Or if, if you're using paid ads, for example, which ones are working? Which one gives you the best return on investment to make sure you're allocating those funds correctly to the right place where you can get more bang for your buck? In content creation, you know, what type of content is really favored by the audience? Diana mentioned reels. Is it reels? Is it videos? Is it social media posts? Knowing what appeals to your audience enables you to spend more time developing those types of storytelling. And lastly, competition, you know, whether you're a not-for-profit or a business, everybody needs to know what others are doing. And the tools that Diana mentioned really enable you to measure and track what's happening against your competition. So something like Agora Pulse actually has a part of its reporting where you can plug in your competitors and, and compare your post to their post and see how you're doing. So again, you know, Google Analytics and YouTube and, you know, podcasting platforms all have these analytic tools built in, or you can find uh, a tool that aggregates everything you're doing if you're using a lot of social media. In larger organizations, it's really, really important that if different departments are using digital tools that you meet once a month or once a quarter or whatever works best for your organization to really talk about what each department is doing so that you're, you, the impact that you can all create is working towards the same goal and you're not you're stepping on each other's toes with posting and it could be a real mess if you if you really don't try to do a coordinated effort. So really in summary, you know, data is invaluable for informed decision-making, especially in the digital space to really achieve your goals. Last slide, please. So, you know, key points to keep in mind as you explore storytelling. Storytelling, again, is a powerful art form to communicate ideas. So you need to be sure to set your goals and objectives. You need to choose the right story, know your target audience, target your message and tailor your message and videos to the platform you're using. You wanna bring your content to life in the best possible way. You also wanna make sure you review your performance to make sure you're on track. And that's where data comes in. But most importantly, most importantly, you need to have fun with all this. This is, you know, social media and creating videos, it, you know, staff love to do it. So really it can be a very fun thing. So we appreciate your time and thank you for listening to all our tips. And I'm going to turn it back over to Gary for Q&A. That was so great. Thank you very much, Elena and Diana. Um, okay, so just a reminder, if you have any questions from in the chat and we have some questions coming in, so let's get started. Um, is there a central calendar for all of the holidays and special days? Um, well, I personally will look up since our organization is centered around disabilities. I will personally look up I'll Google disability holidays. Um, you know, we have certain areas in our organization. So we have autism, spinal cord injury, all those that I mentioned. So I'll look up those types of holidays. Um, so if you just Google search, whatever your, you know, your content is based off of, you can do a Google search. Um, or if you just look up international holiday dates, I'm sure there was something that will come up for you, but it really is based on your organization um, and what your content is. Yeah, there are um, a lot of resources online for not only specialty dates, but also for general calendars. You can find calendars tailoring to religion. You can find calendars tailoring to, you know, the special days. So th there's lots of resources online. Um, the, the question you really need to keep in mind is, and we've eliminated some, how does that particular day track back to your organization. So if you're not working in that area, 
you may not want, you may want to recognize a day, which we'll do like celebrate, you know, happy Labor Day, but we don't work, you know, we, we're not an organization particularly that may have, you know, unions or something like that, that may have more of a, a Labor Day focus. So you really have to be careful on, well, it's all about tailoring your message and what your strategic overall organizational goals are as well. Great. Our next question. I've heard that card services are harder to hire these days because of demand and not enough captioners. Does anyone else have this that experience? Um, I, I think you just need to book well in advance. The same thing with sign language interpretation. If you're doing it around like October Disability Awareness Month, it may be a lot busier. Um, but you know, if you're routinely going to do presentations in UCART, for example, our Entide uses card all the time. We just have them booked in advance. But you know, the the fallback position is to ask people to turn on their um, captioning or have a transcription service. Great. All right, next question. Where do you get those branded QR codes? I've seen those two times today already. Branded QR codes. Um, our creative producer makes those, um, but I believe she... I believe that there are websites that you could use for them. Um, she may also use um, Adobe to create them. I know they're very specific, um, but if you look up, um, you know, custom QR codes, uh, there are probably free sites that you could use um, if you're not familiar with like Adobe or whatever. Yeah, there are a lot of tools out there to, to create that. Um, and then you can customize them. Um, you, some people put specialized designs in them and there's lots of tools to do that. Yeah. Okay. And then the last question, how do you develop keywords to continuously improve your site? Um, well, keywords are really based on what you're posting. So you want to develop them based on your content. So if say, for example, I'm posting something on spinal cord injury, like I'm making a post for that day, the keywords that I would include, um, you know, in my, within my posts would be something like spinal cord injury or spinal cord injury research study, or even if I'm posting something about a specific complication of spinal cord injury, like um, nerve stimulation, spinal cord injury, or bone loss, spinal cord injury, I'll include those words with my post, within my post, and also, you know, on the website somewhere so that when people Google those terms um, are you know, content will come up. So it really is depending on what you're posting about and that's how you first, you choose them. I won't say there's a tool for it also for this one, but um, you know, when you're doing data analysis, there is a way on the back end of working with your IT department, if you want, especially for your website to see what words have come up the most often and been hit on the most often. And that also looks at, you know, which pages come up so you can see some of the keywords. It's also really important that when you're creating materials that you figure out what may be the punch behind it, what may be the keywords. So, you know, if you're talking about um, an event, you know, maybe it's a children's event, you want to see what specific keywords would draw people to maybe children's party or something like that. And then you could get more specific, you know, children's party to celebrate, whatever. Um, and so it, you know, key, that's where coming together as a group to brainstorm on keywords is really important. It's also really important to keep um, evaluating them and reviewing them because popular keywords keep changing all the time. And keywords can also um, be used in your hashtagging too. So that's that little, um, you know, like I'm sure everybody knows what hashtag is now, the little mathematical um, sign, but that's where keywords can carry over from into whatever you're posting. It can be behind your website hidden, and it can also be used for social media. Well, great. Again, I want to thank uh, Diana and Elena for um, your presentation today. I thought it was very informative. I want to thank everyone who came today for participating. Uh, one more quick thank you to our partners, Association Member Trust, Citizen Bank, Focus New Jersey, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield, Miss Avatia, NJBIA HR Support Center, NJ Business Magazine, and NJ Manufacturers for helping to make this educational program happen. I'm um, also I want to put out to everyone, if you think you'd like to be a speaker, let us know. We're currently filling out the rest of the program year, so keep your eyes out peel for incoming emails with more information. And if you'd like to stick around for a few minutes, we'll be doing some networking. But if you got to jump, we thank you for joining us today. Again, thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you.